Hi! In the previous video, I talked about the Practical Subjective Scoring System or PS3. And at the end of the video, I presented this table which summarized the moderate and high risk factors and I showed you how I apply the risk factors on my decision in terms of laser vision correction. However, before you do the same, you have to listen very carefully to this video and you have to know the factors of false positives and false negatives in corneal tomography. The factors are contact lenses, misalignment, large angle kappa, tear film disturbance, posterior surface astigmatism, corneal opacities and pathologies, previous corneal surgeries, early cataract, bad exposure to the camera, and pregnancy, starting with the contact lenses. As you see in this example, there is a hot spot because as I mentioned in episode one, contact lenses may change the surface of the of the cornea by inducing hot spots, irregularities, and by changing the K readings. Therefore, contact lenses should be stopped at least one week before doing topography and before doing any refraction. And if the irregularity persists, in this case, we can extend the period for additional one week and using the lubricants before taking the decision. Misalignment. Misalignment affects, of course, the patterns and the numbers on the corneal tomography, as in this example. As you see, this patient was looking downward while taking the capture. The curvature map shows asymmetric poti inferior steep. In addition, there are bulgings on both anterior and posterior elevation maps and a downward displacement of the pattern of corneal thickness map. This is the same patient after proper realignment. As you see, the abnormalities have disappeared. There are a number of clues of misalignment, as you see here, but I would like you to concentrate on three clues. They are pupil center coordinates, thinnest location coordinates, and inter-eye asymmetry in terms of the coordinates of pupil center and thinnest location. I'll give you examples. First of all, we have to study each eye separately. So if I'm studying the right eye and I find X or Y of the pupil center 0.2 or more, then I have to think of misalignment. Another example, if I find in the left eye X or Y of the thinnest location 0.2 or more, I have to think of misalignment. Now I have to compare both eyes in terms of X and in terms of Y for pupil center and thinnest location. For example, if the X coordinate of the pupil center in the right eye is 0.1 while it is in the left eye 0.3, then the difference is more than 0.1. In this case, there is misalignment. Large angle kappa. All of you, of course, know what angle kappa is. This is an example. This is symmetric bow tie, vertically oriented, representing with the rule astigmatism. Now, if the X component of pupil center or let's say angle kappa is very large, it means that it is large horizontally because it is X component. In this case, based on whether it is negative or positive, then we will have skewed radial axis. And if the Y component of angle kappa or pupil center coordinate is larger than the normal, then in this case, we will have either asymmetric poti superior steep or asymmetric poti inferior steep. And if X and Y are out of the normal range, this will be complicated by skewed radius axis. Now we can imagine misalignment in the same way. For example, if the patient has symmetric bow tie and during taking the capture, the patient was looking to the left, in this case, the symmetric bow tie will show up as symmetric bow tie with skewed radial axis. And this can be more sophisticated with oblique directions of misalignment. Now we can see the same example, but on symmetric bow tie, which is horizontally oriented, representing against the rule astigmatism, as you see, it depends on which component of angle kappa is abnormal, and the same can be said about misalignment depending on the direction of gaze during taking the capture. As you see here, the patient has a normal pattern, but because of large angle kappa or misalignment, it may show as abnormal pattern. Now, we have the opposite. This patient has symmetric bow tie with skewed radial axis, and let's assume that the patient was looking to the left during taking the capture. His pattern will show up as symmetric bow tie. This is called false negative. Now, you can imagine how complicated the case will be by larger components of angle kappa or by other directions of gaze in misalignment. Tear film disturbance. This is a dry eye before treatment. Look at the irregularity and high care readings. Now, this is after treatment. This is a case of excess tears before 
wiping the eye and after wiping the eye. Posterior surface astigmatism, it may affect in two ways. The first one, it will affect the total corneal astigmatism and it may be a factor behind the disparity between the topographical astigmatism and manifest astigmatism. The other way is it affects the calculations of toric IOLs, corneal opacities and pathologies. Any opacity in the cornea and any pathology will cause false findings, even if it is very, very subtle. This is why a careful slit lamp biomicroscopy examination is mandatory. This is a case of corneal scar. As you see, the scar on slit lamp view on the upper right corner and on OCT, anterior OCT, in the lower right corner, and you can see the four composite map on the left. You have to notice that the, the, the scar usually causes flattening on the curvature map, which corresponds to the thinning and corresponds with the outbulging on the elevation maps. And this differentiates this pattern from ectasia, because in ectasia, instead of the flat area that corresponds to the outbulging and the thin cornea, there will be a hotspot corresponding to the outbulging and thin cornea. Fox and good data, sometimes when they are very, very subtle, they can be missed by the very quick slit lamp biomicroscopy. So we have to put that in mind. The same can be said for posterior polymorphous and other pathologies. Previous corneal surgeries, it's very important to ask the patient about any previous corneal surgery. In spite of this, maybe the patient will deny. This is why we have to look for clues by the slit lamp biomicroscopy. This is an example. Uh, let's say the uh, left side shows striae, and if they are micro striae, they cannot be seen without putting fluorescein. On the right side, it is a line of scar because of incomplete flap. On the left side, it is a buttonhole. On the right side, it is peripheral scars because of previous infiltration and inflammation after surface ablation. On the left side, you can see epithelial ingrowth. And on the right side, this is post-surface ablation haze. Early cataract is an important source of disparity in refraction, especially in astigmatism. So we have to put it in mind. And this is why we need to check the lens after dilating the pupil very carefully. Bad exposure to the camera. This may occur because of prominent brows, prominent nasal bridge, small eyes, toes, sunken eyes, or head scarves. And finally, pregnancy, which affects the corneal thickness, corneal curvature, and refraction. To sum up, you have to put in mind the factors that cause false positives and false negatives. In the next episode, I'm going to talk about the five-step practical approach, which is a very easy and simple method to study tomography when you don't have an access to the topographer. Thank you very much.